the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike. This is preeminently the time to speak the truth, the whole truth, frankly and boldly. History doesn't have to be boring, buttoned up, or inaccessible. And it certainly didn't end in 1945. It belongs to all of us, and we share and add to it every day. Welcome to the History of Go-Go podcast, where I interview interesting guests, cover a motley crew of topics, and it's a place where you can sit, think, and drink all at the same time. I'm your host, Rob Mellon. My guest today is author, historian, and speechwriter, Jeff Chessel. A Rhodes Scholar, Jeff received his master's in history from Oxford University in 1993 and graduated from Brown University with highest honors in 1991. His comic strip, Thatch, was nationally syndicated from 1994 to 1998 when it appeared in more than 150 newspapers. He is the author of some excellent books, including Supreme Power, Franklin Roosevelt versus the Supreme Court, which was selected as a New York Times Notable Book of the Year in 2010 and a favorite book of the year by The New Yorker. He also authored Mutual Contempt, Lyndon Johnson, Robert Kennedy, and The Feud That Defined a Decade. And that was also a New York Times Notable Book of the Year. In 1997, President Clinton read Mutual Contempt and invited Shussel to become one of his speechwriters. During his time in the White House, he became Deputy Chief Speechwriter and was a member of the senior staff. Jeff is also a founding partner of West Wing Writers. His most recent work is Mercury Rising, John Glenn, John Kennedy, and the new battleground of the Cold War. And that will be our topic of discussion today. Of Mercury Rising, none other than Matt Damon says, immersive history that lifts us out of the moment we're in and transports us to a time of genuine heroes. And we are very pleased to have the distinguished writer and historian with us today. Welcome, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Well, of course, your book covers the impact of Sputnik in the very beginning and in the context of the Cold War. That launch seemed to refocus a very listless American space program. It not only refocused it, but it focused it really for the first time, and not even fully at that. There really wasn't much of of a space program as we understand it in October of 1957 when Sputnik went up. There were a few different space programs. The Air Force had one, the Navy had one, the Army had its own. So there was a fragmentation of the effort by the United States, and there was also, as you said, there was a listlessness to it. There wasn't a sense that we were in a serious competition with the Soviets. And so Sputnik was a tremendous shock to the system. And it put Eisenhower, who of course was president at that time, it put him very much on the defensive as Democrats like Lyndon Johnson jumped into the fray to to begin to, to make an aggressive case that the United States not only was behind, but that it was behind in a really consequential contest that could determine not only who controlled space, but who controlled life on Earth. Jeff, it is tradition here to accompany the conversation with a special brew. Today, we have Houston Hayes New England-style IPA from the Spindle Top Brewery of Houston, Texas. This double dry hopped IPA comes at you with a ton of fruit flavors. Guava, pineapple, and grapefruit are just some of the juicy tropical notes coming from the Galaxy and Citra hops. Remember, the best way to enjoy the podcast is with one of our featured brews. This is also my time to ask you to subscribe to the podcast. All you have to do, hit that subscribe button on the directory that you use and get the newest episodes right away. 
and to all of the listeners and supporters from 1,500 cities from across the globe, I have to say thank you. And now, I raise my Houston Hayes IPA very high. And to all of those who dared to dream and took those bold steps to get us into space, I say cheers. You know, you mentioned Lyndon Johnson, and that is interesting. From his background, you would not think he would be one that would jump in with two feet. Is it a, just a, a political opportunist perspective, or does he have a real understanding that this competition is something that the United States is going to be engaged in for more than a decade or longer? Johnson definitely saw the potential of space exploration, and he saw it early on. But he also, as you said, he saw political opportunity. And in fact, immediately after the launch of Sputnik, one of Johnson's key political advisors, a guy named George Reedy, wrote him a memo and said, in his words, plunge heavily into this one. It could get you elected president. Mm. And so that's what Johnson did. He was not an expert on aviation. He was not an expert on aeronautics or on space or any of this. But he was a cold warrior, as most of them were in those days. And he really did believe that if the Soviets, as I said, and I was paraphrasing LBJ himself, if the Soviets controlled space, they would control the Earth. And so this uh, was not only a political opportunity for Johnson to show leadership, but it was also alarming to him and to most Americans and also to our allies around the world. This was not just a, an American concern, but our allies were looking uh, across the water in the case of Britain, in the case of France and West Germany, to see whether the United States was able to keep pace with the Soviets in terms of our science and technology and also, by the way, our military. And it did not look good in 1957. There was a lot of concern. The concerns were growing, and they continued to grow over the next three, four years as the Soviets achieved one spectacular first in space after another. It wasn't just Sputnik. It was a whole series of things. In my opinion, we do not have as much time as we had after Pearl Harbor. But we do have time. And we do have determination. And we do have... Willpower. Your book, though, focuses on Mercury, which is putting a man into space. How far back does that concept go? When you did your research, did you find that there was very much of a, of a thought of putting a man into space before NASA? Well, the idea, of course, goes way, way back. This was a, a fantasy going back more than a century, the idea that, that someday human beings would walk on the moon, that they would explore the stars. There were science fiction novels written in the early part of the 20th century and so forth. And so the idea was kind of always out there in popular culture. But science really began to catch up with popular culture by the 1950s. And what the Air Force and uh, the Navy were, were achieving in terms of high speed, high altitude, and ultimately a supersonic and transonic flight was, was absolutely incredible. And so you had pilots that in these experimental aircraft in the X-1 and ultimately the X-15, we're getting far closer and closer to what you would actually call space, where, wherever you define the, the boundary. And so the, the notion that, that we could do this was taking hold. But what's interesting is that the rationale for doing it was almost an afterthought. The Air Force certainly had the notion that its pilots would fly around in space in these transonic jets and engage in dogfights, presumably with, with Soviets doing the same thing up there. They had a, the idea that essentially you take the theaters of war here in the earth or just above it in the atmosphere, and you just take that into outer space and sort of do the same thing, just more spectacularly. But beyond that, there really wasn't a clear sense of, well, why even that was necessary, or why science would be advanced by sending human beings up there to I guess, as, as they saw it at the time, look out of a little porthole and describe what they saw, as opposed to sending more and more sophisticated pieces of equipment out up there to record things like, uh, to observe things like the magnetic field around, the magnetic fields around the Earth, or to observe cloud patterns from above and really understand meteorology in a way that, that we hadn't yet, and so forth. So, there were not a lot of scientists, actually, who thought it was so important to send human beings into space. They wanted to send satellites into space. They wanted to send cameras into space. But human beings, it wasn't clear to them either that it was actually so important. 
Well, and that extends to Eisenhower as well. So Dwight D. Eisenhower was famously pretty disinterested in space exploration. And I think there's a quote in your book where he says, we don't have any enemies on the moon. It's just not practical to him. What fault does he have, though? Because you mentioned we are behind the Soviets at that point. We're falling further behind. Does he bear any of that burden? He absolutely does. I mean, in a way, I I think he bears the primary burden because he was in the decision-making capacity for most of the 1950s. And he really did not see the value of space exploration, period. There was one area that interested him in space, and that was the idea of spy satellites, reconnaissance satellites. He was very concerned, as most Americans were, with the idea of a surprise nuclear attack by the Soviet Union. And so U-2 flights were one thing. So we sent these planes high in the atmosphere above the, the Soviet Union, but they could get shot down, as happened in, in 1960. And so the idea that, that we could have satellites up there keeping an eye on things, that was appealing to Eisenhower. But the other science experiments he thought were sort of silly. He thought that the scientists were lining up with their hands out to receive taxpayer money to build what he calls gadgets. And he just didn't see the importance of it. And man in space, as it was known at the time, even less so. The line that, that you quoted there, that we don't have any enemies in the moon, that was very much the way he saw it. And, and that was a reasonable enough view. The idea that we were going to engage in space combat was really pretty ludicrous. But at the same time, what Johnson understood and what John Kennedy would later understand that Eisenhower didn't was that the world was watching. As I said before, Our own allies, and certainly our enemies, were looking at these two superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union, to see which one was more capable in space. And it really was believed that that technological capacity equated to to military power. It, It was not a coincidence that we were sending these satellites up when we finally began to do that on missiles, on intercontinental ballistic missiles. And so... The Soviet lead was seen to represent a Soviet lead militarily as well. That was wrong, but it was easy to jump to that conclusion. And many Americans did. Many people across the free world did. Many defense experts jumped to that conclusion. And in fact, John Kennedy, when he ran for for president in 1960, he jumped to that conclusion himself. It was a very natural one to make. And Eisenhower did not foresee that even though it became clear really within the first 24, 48 hours after Sputnik went up. Well, he does, though, sign the bill that creates NASA. So what's the early days of NASA like then if you don't have the commander-in-chief completely behind it? The early days of NASA were uncertain as as a result. First, there was a a lot of work that had to be done to, to figure out how to build this big new civilian agency, and also, uh, you know, w- what other components of the federal government needed to be absorbed by it in order for it to do its job, and also then to define its mission. And and as you pointed out, uh, you had a president in this case who was not interested in human space exploration, and yet there was a lot of momentum for that as I described earlier. And so it was happening, but was it going to be fully funded? Was it going to be supported by the president? He picked as his first NASA administrator, a man named Keith Glennon, who shared a lot of Eisenhower's own suspicions or or skepticism about human space exploration. And so when Keith Glennon announced that NASA would create something called Project Mercury, and that Project Mercury would be the manned space program that eventually would send somebody up in a capsule into space. He so underplayed the news, this is in late 1958, that the Washington Evening Star didn't even put it on the front page. I mean, it's incredible when you think about it from our perspective today. This was the dawn of the space program in the United States. They didn't, the human space program, they didn't even put it on the, on the front page. They put it on page A10. Wow. While on page A1, on the front page that day, there was a story about whether the residents of Fairfax County, Virginia, were allowed legally to shoot stray cats that wandered onto their property. The answer was no, they were not allowed to shoot stray cats. That was front page news. Project Mercury wasn't. And so that's the extent of the switch itself from its own program. Our prospects are both challenging and exciting. I know of no better way of summing up than to quote Senator Lyndon Johnson, chairman of the Special Committee on Space and Astronautics, who said during our August 14th confirmation hearing, 
and I quote this, there are no blueprints or roadmaps which clearly mark out the course. The limits of the job are no less than the limits of the universe. And those are limits which can be stated but are virtually impossible to describe. In a sense, the course of the new agency can be compared to the voyage of Columbus to the new world. The only difference is that Columbus, with his charts drawn entirely from imagination, had a better idea of his destination than we possibly have when we step into outer space. We do know certain things. We want outer space to be a highway to peace and prosperity and not a road to war. We seek a maximum development of all the potentialities and not just a narrow production of new weapons. So let's get into Project Mercury then. What are the years of its formation? How long did it last? And then how did they determine that initial group of astronauts that would take part? Project Mercury was created in, in late 1958. As you mentioned, President Eisenhower signed the bill, the Space Act, it was called. And that was uh, toward the end of the, it was in the middle of the summer of 1958. NASA was created. Ultimately, the, the manned program, Project Mercury, was created. And then they had to get to work in picking the astronauts. And they had to decide what an astronaut was going to do, where to find them, what qualifies you to be an astronaut. All of this had to be invented, even the term astronaut had to be created in this moment. There was some discussion of what these pilots would be called or whether they even needed to be pilots at all. If they were going up in in capsules that they didn't really need to control, which was certainly the feeling on the part of a lot of the engineers that the whole thing ought to be run from the ground or on autopilot, well, maybe you didn't need a pilot. Maybe you needed somebody who was just brave and willing to put themselves through some act of, of physical daring, maybe skydivers or deep sea divers would would be well qualified for this. There was some discussion of that. Ultimately, President Eisenhower himself made the call that the pool would be military test pilots, not only because they had the obvious skills if this thing did need to be flown, but also because as uh, members of the military, they were used to keeping things secret and they they wanted uh, the particulars of the selection process and also the training to be kept secret. And there was just a level of trust in military test pilots that they wouldn't have in, uh, you know, somebody who had, was famous for, for skydiving. And so the, the, the pool was developed. The selections were made over a, an elaborate process of, of testing, probably the most rigorous and almost a, a absurd level of testing, both psychological and physical, of this pool of candidates. And they come out in, in the spring of 1959 with seven of them, Mercury 7. And John Glenn is really the, the, the first and foremost among them. He's the only one who is, is famous already when he's selected as an astronaut. He had, he had won fame a couple of years earlier as a test pilot, setting a transcontinental speed record. He's also a war hero, both in, in World War II and in Korea. So Glenn was well known. The other six were not. And they stepped onto the stage at NASA headquarters at the Dolly Madison House across from the White House. And it was almost another two years before any of them actually got to, to, it was more than two years, actually, just a little more than two years before any of them actually flew into space. The program itself lasted until 1963, at which point it had done its work and Gemini was ready, which was the next major step toward the Apollo program and the moon landing. Well, I'm 50 years old, so when I think of John Glenn, I think of him as a senator and a statesman, but you mentioned part of his background as a war hero. But let's take it back a little bit further than that. If you go back to the beginning, what forms John Glenn to make him a war hero and then eventually an astronaut? Glenn came from a a small town, and I mean a really small town, in uh, southeastern Ohio called New Concord. It was a town of about a thousand people. It's about a mile across. And Glenn was very much a product of his environment. It was a, a very religious town. Just about everybody at the time there was Presbyterian. As Glenn said, they either went to one Presbyterian church or the other Presbyterian church. It was a very patriotic town and a very patriotic time. Glenn's father was a veteran of World War I, a very proud veteran. He was not someone who was scarred by the experience as so many were. And it was also a town, uh, New Concord, 
with a, a college in it, Muskingum College, which really defined life in, in the small town and, and it made it very different than a number of the surrounding towns that were more agricultural or, or industrial. And there was a little bit more of a, an intellectual or academic flair to, to life in the town. And Glenn's mother had, had gone to Muskingum. And, and so Glenn absorbed all of these influences. He was a very happy kid. He was a successful student. He was an athlete. He was popular. He married his, not just his high school sweetheart, but a girl that he had met in a playpen when they were two and, and three years old, Annie Castor. Um, and they spent the next 90 years of, of their lives together. So Glenn really was the authentic article. And he represented an America that was very present in 1921 when he was born. But um, by the 1950s, 1960s seemed to be lost in the, in the mists of, of time. And so part of the appeal of John Glenn was that he represented both this kind of mythologized American past, and at the same time, he was speeding America quite literally into the future. He was, again, of the Mercury 7, he was the most highly decorated combat pilot among them. Not all of them had even flown in combat. Alan Shepard had never flown in combat. and was sort of a sore spot for him. But Glenn was highly decorated in both World War II and Korea and then became a famous test pilot, as I mentioned before. And so Glenn really represented, as, as John Kennedy would, would soon find, he really represented what Kennedy called the new frontier and uh, this kind of transition from the American past in, into this incredible future in which people put on silver spacesuits and, and, and flew around up there among the stars. I've been very curious about things all my life. My dad was curious. And uh, he liked to take on trips. He used to look into all sorts of things. He used to tell me his objective in life was to give me as many experiences as I could as a young person. I had a, uh, a high school teacher who was particularly good in teaching. In, he taught civics, a study of government and politics. And uh, he just made it come alive. And I used to look forward to his classes. And I was curious about what I might be able to do sometime. Never thought I'd be able to be in high public office or anything like that. But that curiosity that he imbued in me led me into some directions coming out of the space program, and I was in the Senate then for 24 years. You know, you bring up something that I think is important, and we wrestle with it even today, the nostalgia or wanting the past. And what John Glenn does, based on your description there, is that traditional American past, that rural farming past, has a place in the future. So there's an element to it I didn't think about until you made that comment. You know, it's very interesting. When you look at the coverage, as, as I did, and I write about this in the book, when, when you look at the coverage of the country's reaction to the selection of these seven individuals as the, the first astronauts, one of whom could become the first person in space, turned out that a Soviet wound up getting, getting that distinction. But the, uh, at any rate, there was an incredible focus on these men. And, of course, it was taken for granted that they were all sensational pilots. But a lot of the focus was the fact that they all just seemed like the guy next door, somebody that you knew in high school. And I mean, this was true if you were a white, middle class, middle American. But of course, most Americans at that time were white, middle class, middle Americans. And so they seemed to just represent a very familiar type. They went to church, or at least they said they went to church. Not all of them did as, <laughs> as uh, regularly as, as Glenn did. Right. All of them were married. Uh, now, one of them, Gordon Cooper, was, was having a lot of difficulty in his marriage and had been separated, but that was kind of hushed up. And so they all just seemed like guys that you would know. They were in their 30s. They had families. And so there was a lot of pride being taken, and you can read it in the editorials and the news articles, that you know, this wasn't some sort of new breed of American. This was a very familiar American type who was going to lead us into the future. So that was very important to their appeal. and No one represented it more fully than John Glenn did. So let's juxtapose that initial announcement that you mentioned that Glennon has for the project, Project Mercury, with the announcement of the Mercury 7 and those astronauts who become almost celebrities. So how different were those announcements? Because the press seemed to be stepping over themselves on the announcement of the astronauts. Literally, they were stepping over themselves, stepping over each other. They were the, the reporters in the room were were climbing over each other. They were getting up on chairs and 
throwing elbows and getting as close as they could to these, these seven men on, on the stage. And it, it really was as different from that Glennon moment that, that I described as anything could possibly be. It's one thing to say we're going to have a, a manned space program. It's another thing to put seven pilots in front of the country and in front of the world on newsreels and in newspapers and say, these are the guys. One of them is going to be the next Columbus, which is the way that that they were talked about at the time, discovering this this new world. And so there was an immediate and intense public fascination with the seven. There were profiles written. They wound up signing an exclusive deal with Life magazine to tell their stories. And so America got to know them and got to know their families. Now, granted, again, it was an idealized notion of them and their families, because in in many cases, their actual family lives were, were more complicated. But say, then um, it would be portrayed in Life magazine. But they, they were absolutely celebrities. They were huge celebrities. And again, as I mentioned before, it was going to be two years. It turned out it wasn't supposed to be at the outset, but it wound up being two years before any of them actually got into space. And so America lived with these seven for, for a couple of years before that even happened, knew them extremely well. So there was a strong identification with this group of astronauts that really was never equaled with the subsequent groups. Once you pick another group and another group after that, other than Neil Armstrong and, and to some extent Buzz Aldrin, none of, of the other astronauts ever achieved the, the level of, of celebrity that, that the original seven did. These men, the nation's Project Mercury astronauts, are here after a long and perhaps unprecedented series of evaluations which told our medical consultants and scientists of their superb adaptability to their coming flight. Which of these men will be first to orbit the Earth, I cannot tell you. He won't know himself until the day of the flight. The astronaut training program will last probably two years. During this time, our urgent goal is to subject these gentlemen to every stress, each unusual environment they will experience in that flight. Before the first flight, we will have developed our Mercury spaceship to the point where it will be as reliable as man can devise. We expect it to be as reliable as any experimental aircraft. It's my pleasure to introduce to you, and I consider it a very real honor, gentlemen. From your right, Malcolm S. Carpenter, Leroy Leroy G. Cooper, John H. Glenn, Virgil I. Grissom, Walter M. Shira, Alan B. Shepard, Donald K. Slayton. These ladies and gentlemen are the nation's Mercury astronauts. You see the image of of Jeff Bezos and he goes into space and he's wearing a cowboy hat. And that image or that thought of space cowboys, does that go back to this time period and does it have any connection to the society at the time? Well, in fact, the term space cowboy goes back a ways and was thrown around at the time. And these fighter pilots, fighter jocks, they were called, certainly had that kind of persona. I mean, they defined it in a way. They drove around in Corvettes, which uh, were leased to them for a buck a year by a, a dealer near Cape Canaveral. They wore the aviators. They were aviators. And they really re- represented this this very kind of this cool, edgy, tough ideal and, and living on the, the very edge of, of danger. And, and so this, this does go way back. But they were also, I think it's important to point out, they were, again, military test pilots. And so they lived within a system where you kind of kept your cool. What it was to be cool was to, to kind of hold it in and not to show off in some outlandish way. And so the idea of putting on a cowboy hat, shaking up a bottle of champagne and spraying it all over each other, which is what, of course, Jeff Bezos and the others did when they got back to Earth, is something that I think most of the astronauts would would find pretty antithetical, that it was just a, it would be an embarrassing display 
I mean, it's funny to say because these guys, the original Mercury 7, they really lived it up late at night on Cocoa Beach, all of them, except for John Glenn and to some extent Scott Crowe. But they never would have engaged in a public display like that. Yeah, that's a military concept. You can live it up on your own and within your own group of people, but you don't do it publicly. I've been in the Army for 27 years, so I'm an Army officer, and that would resonate with me. You don't do anything like that publicly. It makes sense. And you mention their test pilots. They're not immune to fear, I should say. But there is a, a scene in your book, or you, you describe a scene in your book where they take those seven out, they invite them to watch a launch, I think, of one of the rockets, and it ends in disaster. And their reaction is pretty amazing. It is pretty amazing. I, I mean, this was NASA looking to kind of show off the, the rocket, the booster rocket that these guys would eventually ride. And and it, it blows up over their heads in an incredibly horrific and spectacular way, as, as it was always the case when one of these things blew up, which happened a lot. And they kind of looked at each other, and in their gallows humor kind of way, they, they joked about it. Alan Shepard said to the others, I hope they fix that thing before we have to ride on it. And they all sort of <laughs> laughed. But they understood. This, this was a serious business. They had lived as you said, as test pilots with mortal danger at all times. The whole idea of being a military test pilot was to take an experimental piece of equipment and push it to its limits and see where the problems were. I mean, that's why so many of them died. It wasn't because they were all reckless. It was because that was the nature of the job, was not to do something safe. And so they lived with that understanding and to some extent that fear. They they had found ways of dealing with it, all of them. And yet, this was different. This was different. This is the idea of being put in a little capsule that at the time didn't even have a window in it. Mm. They had to push, they had to argue with NASA engineers to get them to put a a little porthole in it, which was the first window they got. They then later got a larger window. But at first, they were just supposed to be sealed into this little titanium can and stuck at the top of an intercontinental ballistic missile. (laughs) And as I mentioned, these things had a terrible track record of blowing up on the launch pad. And so they, they understood. They all agreed. It was clear to them that one of them was going to die over the course of Project Mercury. And it was just a question of which one and when. As it turned out, none of them died during Project Mercury. But of course, Gus Grissom died in the horrific fire of Apollo 1 in 1967. Right. But they certainly took it for granted that one of them was, was not going to make it. Let's switch gears a little bit and let's go back to the commander in chief because Kennedy wins the 1960 election throughout his early days of his presidency or the early years of his presidency. He has some very famous speeches about space exploration. They seem to stand as the inspiration of the program even today, but he wasn't always in favor of the program either. What is the journey that he goes on to finally accept the program as essential? to American success. Well, you're right that those speeches, particularly the the announcement at at the end of May 1961 that the United States would go to the the moon by the end of the decade, and then the speech that that Kennedy gave in 1962 at Rice University, why do we go to the moon? We do these things because they're difficult, not because they're, they're easy. And we remember the boldness of that pledge, and of course we know that the pledge was fulfilled, that we did actually get to the moon by the end of the 1960s. But I I think what's been lost for most Americans, and this is something that I really wanted to bring across in the book, is Kennedy's sense of uncertainty at the beginning of his presidency. He is not committed to this goal. He was a skeptic about it in the the late 1950s, not in a big way. It just wasn't something that excited him. He didn't think it was all that important. But when he ran for president in 1960, and I touched on this a little while ago, he saw the, the, the political power of the issue. And he saw that The case that he was making that America in the 1950s had lost its vigor, had lost initiative, had lost its drive in the competition, the global competition with an aggressive Soviet Union, that we had gotten too complacent and had fallen too much in love with our consumer goods, with our color televisions and our, you know, very big cars and and so forth, that space was a powerful symbol of that. And the fact that that we had fallen behind in in this cutting-edge technology of space exploration suggested the whole of the argument, in a way. And Kennedy argued in 1960 that it was unacceptable to be second in space, that to be second in space 
was to be second in the eyes of the world in science and technology and military power and in this larger defining struggle, existential struggle between freedom and totalitarianism. But when Kennedy was elected president that fall, he didn't actually have a plan to make America first in space. And it was not really his top priority. There, were, there was a lot going on in the world. There were problems everywhere, it seemed. There was a civil war in Laos. There was a, a conflict that seemed likely at any time to erupt into a nuclear conflict in Berlin, in the occupied city of, of Berlin. You had problems in Cuba, which had fallen to uh, Castro and the communist rebels just a year earlier in 1959. And so Kennedy was facing all of this. He was facing a, a building civil rights revolution here in the United States that he didn't quite know what to, to do about at the time. And so space fell down his list of concerns and really remained there until April of 1961 when the Soviets succeeded in the most spectacular first of all, which was sending the first man into space, Yuri Gagarin, who orbited the Earth once before coming back safely. That was the huge shock to the system. And Kennedy immediately recognized something needed to be done. A big goal needed to be set. The space program needed to mobilize and be well-funded. And uh, he needed to figure out what that big goal was going to be. The dramatic achievements in space, which occurred in recent weeks, should have made clear to us all, as did the Sputnik in 1957, the impact of this adventure on the minds of men everywhere who are attempting to make a determination of which road they should take. Since early in my term, our efforts in space have been under review. With the advice of the Vice President, who is Chairman of the National Space Council, we have examined where we are strong and where we are not, where we may succeed and where we may not. Now it is time to take longer strides, time for a great new American enterprise, time for this nation to take a clearly leading role in space achievement, which in many ways may hold the key to our future on Earth. I believe we possess all the resources and talents necessary, but the facts of the matter are that we have never made the national decisions or marshaled the national resources required for such leadership. We have never specified long-range goals on an urgent time schedule or managed our resources and our time so as to ensure their fulfillment. I therefore ask the Congress, above and beyond the increases I have earlier requested for space activities, to provide the funds which are needed to meet the following national goals. First, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space, and none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. Well, and it doesn't take him long after that. There is a, a quote in that Rice University speech, I believe, and it was in 62, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. He puts it into context for everyone, how bold that statement is to get to the moon by the end of the decade. He references back to Lindbergh, and it's only like 30-some years that we couldn't even cross the Atlantic, and now we have set a goal of getting to the moon. I don't think people today realize how far science had come so quickly. You know, I was just thinking about this the other day, actually, that even putting aside Lindbergh, the gap of time between the Wright brothers' first flight wow. and the, the first human being in space is a smaller gap of time than between that moment, the, the orbit of, of Yuri Gagarin, and today. And I, I mean, th 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 that's how fast it, it, all, it all happened, was in that span between the first decade of, of the 20th century and, and the early 1960s. But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why, 35 years ago, fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal, 
will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. So if you go back to that craft that you mentioned that John Glenn has to get in, and he's sitting on the top of that, which is an intercontinental ballistic missile. What is that craft like itself? Like when John Glenn eventually orbits the Earth, I think it's three times, what's he in? Well, so he's he's inside a, a capsule with a titanium skin that was developed primarily by McDonnell. And it had evolved a, a little bit over the previous year. And I mentioned before, it went from having no window to having a porthole. And in Glenn's case, there was a, a decent sized and better positioned window so that he could not only see the Earth below, but he could also potentially orient himself by the horizon line and also by the stars. And the size of the thing is, is actually, it's hard to believe how small it is. I, I think we, if you go to the, the Air and Space Museum at the Smithsonian, which I imagine you, you probably have at some point, it, it is shocking every time to see how small this capsule is, that this was the scale of things inside. The cockpit was a, about as, as small as the cockpit in a, in a in a fighter jet. That's how much room he had to, and we're used to the pictures, the video that exists of the Apollo astronauts and other astronauts uh, floating around inside the, the capsule, which was pretty small in, in, in that case, but at least there was room to, to unbuckle and float around, but not at all in the Mercury capsule. And it was seated atop the particular ICBM we're talking about in this case was, was the Atlas. It was the Atlas rocket which actually had an excellent track record as an ICBM if it ever had to be used in a nuclear war. Thankfully, it didn't. But it was an excellent, excellent missile. But when you put, instead of a a small nuclear payload at the top of it, when you put a capsule, uh, this chunky thing that I just described, as small as it was, the missile initially was not meant to carry something like this. And so it tended to, to throw it off, which is one of the reasons that the tests had gone so badly over the course of the, the preceding years and why these things had gone awry and ended up in the ocean instead of in space or they had blown up along the way, as we were describing beforehand. And the Atlas was, in fact, so difficult to man rate, as they called it, and which meant this thing is safe enough, in theory, to put a human being on top of. Uh, it was so difficult to man rate that Glenn would wind up being the first American to ride on top of it. The two Americans who got to space before Glenn did, both uh, Alan Shepard and Gus Grissom, they flew on a, a more reliable and less powerful rocket called the Redstone. And that was the lack of power in the Redstone was the reason that they were not able to orbit the Earth. It was a suborbital flight mm-hmm. that, that both of those astronauts took. It went up and it came down 15 minutes from start to finish. But Glenn had the first orbital flight, and that took a more powerful rocket and, in fact, a more dangerous rocket. So this was an even riskier business than it, than it already was. So you mentioned, obviously, Grissom dies later in the Apollo project, but during the Mercury, were there ever any very close calls, or were the astronauts ever in danger, even John Glenn, during his orbiting of the Earth? The astronauts were in danger at various points in the program, absolutely. Uh, Glenn faced a couple of problems during his flight. I, I, we, we remember, you and I are the same age, so I'm not old enough to re- remember these, these images myself, but of course grew up with this history being very much alive. But the parades and all the celebrations, we know that, that John Glenn got back okay. But as he orbited the Earth three times, the folks in, in mission control were not so sure he was going to get back alive not just out of general superstition, but because a couple of things went wrong. After the first orbit, which went very well, Glenn's autopilot began to, to malfunction, and the capsule began to skate out of alignment, sort of like a car with its, with its wheels out of alignment. And then the thrusters would automatically kick in and move it back into alignment, and then it would drift again and just sort of went back and forth, wasting fuel. So Glenn had to take over manual control of the capsule. Now, that actually was fine with Glenn. He had always preferred to fly it rather than just sit there and let the autopilot do it. So that was okay with him. But there was a potentially more dangerous problem that seemed to present itself at the end of that first orbit. A warning light went on at Mercury Control in Cape Canaveral, and it indicated that Glenn's heat shield was starting to separate from the capsule in space. Now, if that happened, there was no way he was going to get 
back through the, the atmosphere, the 3,000 degree heat of reentry without being incinerated, if there was any gap between that heat shield and the capsule that it was meant to protect. And Glenn didn't know that this warning light had gone on at the Cape, and they didn't tell him. They believed, Chris Kraft, who was the flight director, believed that Glenn might panic if they told him about it. Never mind that he was a test pilot who had been selected precisely because he didn't panic in dangerous situations. Kraft decided not to tell Glenn, but there was a lot of panic, I'll tell you, in Mission Control, and I talked to some of the individuals who were, were there in the room at that time, and they didn't know whether the, the light, the warning light should be trusted. They didn't know whether it was accurate, but if it was accurate, they didn't think there was probably any way of saving his life, but they had to try, and so a very intense debate began and continued to the very last minute, literally, before Glenn came back through the atmosphere to see if there was anything that could be done. And meanwhile, they kept Glenn as best they could in the dark. During reentry, then, instead of jettisoning that retro pack here uh, and getting it off so I had a clean heat shield for reentry, we left that on so that the heat shield would be held in place until the aerodynamic force of reentry uh, would tend to hold the heat shield in place. Now that made for an, an interesting, well, the, the re-entry was going to be interesting anyway, but it was even more interesting because as I would glance occasionally out the little window, I could see chunks of that retro pack breaking up and coming back by the window. My condition is good, but that was a real fireball, boy. I had great chunks of that retro pack breaking off all the way through rocking quite a bit. I may still have some of that pack on. I can't damp it either. And I couldn't be absolutely certain then whether it was the uh, heat shield breaking up or the retro pack. And uh, obviously it was a retro pack or it wouldn't be here today. But anyway, it was a, that kind of re-entry was the second problem we had in addition to the uh, control system failure. So I think of the 1980s, as you mentioned, you're 50. So we grew up during that same time period. And Ronald Reagan had a program which we call uh, Star Wars now, which would basically blow up intercontinental missiles and uh, nuclear uh, missiles that would come towards the United States. And the thought process of that was not only for that protection, but really to put an economic stress on the Soviet Union. If you go back to the space race, are they, is that thinking too far into the future where maybe Kennedy realized if they were going to try to reach the moon before the United States, it would put an incredible pressure on the Soviet economic system where the American system could sustain it, but the Soviets could not? Am I reading a little bit too much into that? You're not reading too much into it. That was part of the thinking, absolutely. And it's one of the reasons why Kennedy chose the goal of going to the moon as opposed to some nearer term, more achievable goal. There were a number of things that went into that decision. But one, one was, frankly, that we were so far behind the Soviets in the near term that Kennedy knew, everyone at NASA knew that we were not going to catch up to them in the next couple of years, two, three, five years, wherever you put it. The Soviets were, were going to maintain their lead. But if we picked a goal that was big enough and expensive enough and distant enough and required enough new technology that neither side had come up with yet, well, then maybe we might be able to leapfrog the Soviets by the end of the decade. And outspending the Soviets was, was definitely part of the picture. Kennedy was not particularly excited about the United States spending all that money to send someone to the moon. He decided it was necessary, but he wasn't excited about it and continued to, to question his own decision really through the rest of his life, whether it was going to be worth it for the many, many billions of dollars it was going to take to get there. But there was an understanding or at least a hope that the Soviets would not be able to, to maintain their, their effort economically for, for that duration. No one was sure because th there was the, the understanding that totalitarian systems offer a couple of advantages. And one is that if the, the supreme leader decides this is going to be our national focus, then it's going to be the national focus. And there's not going to be, he doesn't have to go to the Appropriations Committee in the House of Representatives to see whether that's going to be possible. And so even given the relative strength of, of the United States economy, there was a feeling that Soviet single-mindedness, dedication to this goal might be able to, to supersede the economic advantage that we had. So there were no guarantees, but it was it was a hope and it was an instinct. 
So if we go back to Lyndon Johnson, he's vice president at the time. And then, of course, after the assassination, he'll become president. How important is he to the success of NASA? He's hugely important. I mean, he's one of really the founding fathers of, of NASA, and, and I think in an unsung way. I mean, yes, we have the Johnson Space Center at, at Houston that's named after him. But I think the boldness and, and the eloquence of Kennedy's pledge to go to the moon by the end of the decade, and the fact that, of course, Kennedy was president and Johnson was only vice president, we really give the, the credit to the, to the person in charge. But Johnson, as, as we've been discussing, was ahead of everybody really, uh, all other Democrat politicians in seeing the threat and in keeping up the pressure on Eisenhower to try to organize to meet it. Johnson is really the principal force behind the Space Act that, that Eisenhower felt that he had to sign in 1958. Eisenhower didn't want to create a space agency, but Johnson helped to create the, the, the political conditions that made it necessary. Uh, I mean, of course, Sputnik did, but it was Johnson who then focused that energy on the creation of of the space agency. And it was also Johnson who developed, in effect, a lot of the talking points that Kennedy used about space in 1960. And so it was natural that when Kennedy became president, he actually assigned Johnson to be the head of the White House Space Council. And in that role, uh, helped to to organize the effort in, in its early days. He helped to select the NASA administrator, James Webb, and he was the person that Kennedy turned to after Yuri Gagarin orbited the Earth, and Kennedy didn't know what to do. And he put Johnson in charge of figuring it out. And Johnson already knew what the goal needed to be. He was already plugged in and determined that it was going to be that, that we should go to the moon. And he set about marshalling all of the support for this to put the decision in front of Kennedy and make it as, as clear and as obvious as possible. So Johnson is the, the driving force to and through that decision. Now, once the decision is made and the space program has its clear goal, then it was really left to James Webb to get us there. And Johnson recedes, not happily, from the center of the stage. Yeah, of course, not happily for Johnson. He likes the center of the stage. (laughs) (laughs) So does the Kennedy assassination have any impact on the space program itself? It happens the same year as the end of the Mercury program. It does. And actually, um, I mean, as as enormous as as the Kennedy assassination was and and in many ways remains in terms of its its impact, it it did not affect the the space program particularly because it was already, the the momentum was, was already there. The plans were already developed. A lot of the key decisions that would shape Apollo were, were already made. And so it was really left to, to Johnson as president to, to maintain that, which, of course, he did. He was absolutely committed to doing it. Now, if you'd had a president come in who was supportive of the program, then there might have been difficulties. But that was unthinkable with, with Johnson in the role, both given his, his longstanding commitment to space exploration and also his uh, intimacy with the Congress. And so Johnson was able to kind of keep it on, on that very determined footing that, that Kennedy had put it on. There's a quote that you use at the very beginning of the book. It actually is before the actual text of the book. And I'll have to paraphrase it, but this shows what a great nation can do when they're completely focused. And I think of today when we have a real challenge, say the pandemic, for example, among other things, but the pandemic, and we don't seem to have that singularity of focus necessary for the attributes of a great nation to actually make real success. It is one of the reasons that the the moonshot continues to loom so large in our national consciousness and and our rhetoric. If you just were to to, to Google politicians talking about a moonshot, I mean, it, it continues to be the standard for a big national goal that we achieve against the odds and feeling as if we were able to do this and do it so quickly, really, in, in context. Why can't we do these other things that are so important? And uh, one of the things that I really try to do in the book is to to break down this notion that it was all inevitable, that somehow it was fated that we would get to the moon by the end of the decade, that we would beat the Soviets and all the rest of it. But I I wanted to show the, the sense of struggle, the sense of uncertainty, the contingencies of history that make clear that if it had not been for this decision or if it had not been for that individual or that achievement, then it might not have happened at all. 
and uh, we would be living in a very different reality. And so, you know, I, I think that that's why I chose in the end to focus on both John Glenn and, and John Kennedy, because I feel that there are a lot of people in the in this story that we could describe as instrumental, and we've been talking about LBJ. But it's really uh, Kennedy's decision and, and Glenn's orbiting the Earth that, that puts the space program on a footing where you could say that it achieves what they call in the field, they call escape velocity. When, when something has finally achieved the, the kind of momentum to escape the gravitational pull of the Earth, that's what happened with the space program after Glenn orbited the Earth in February of 1962. Were you able to interview any current NASA officials or administrators? I didn't actually look to, to speak to current officials and administrators. I've spoken to a good number of them, including the, the new administrator himself, Bill Nelson. Subsequently? Yeah, subsequent to the book coming out. But I was really focused in my work on the book on people who were participants in, in the 1960s. Well, and what it really does is leads to my last question for you. Do you think that those administrators today hearken back to that time and still learn lessons from that boldness from the original, say, Mercury Project? Absolutely. In, in fact, I, I don't think I'm spilling any confidence this year because he said so publicly. But Administrator Nelson has taken a real interest in, in this book, which is, of course, incredibly gratifying. Because he finds these stories to be so important to our understanding of what we need to do going forward. And that we need to understand, again, that it wasn't easy. Uh, and he points this, Bill Nelson points this out all the time. He quotes that Rice speech that you and I have been quoting. We do these things uh, not because they're easy, but because they're hard. And, and as Bill Nelson says, space is hard. And people need to prepare themselves for struggle and for setback but also to understand why we're in this business to begin with and why it is so integral to our national goals. Well, thank you very much, Jeff. I appreciate it. And of course, I think not just NASA, but we can all learn as we go through the pandemic, as I'd mentioned before, from the boldness and the struggles and then making it through those struggles to a brighter future. We can all learn from those lessons that you cover in your book. I couldn't agree more that we need some of that boldness and that there are lessons to be learned from, from this particular period. Um, this is, in that line that you quoted, it was a line of James Webb. This is how a great nation tackles a great problem. And we certainly have great problems of our own that need tackling today. That's for sure. Well, thanks, Jeff. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. This was a, a really great conversation. I would like to thank my guest, historian, speechwriter, and author, Jeff Schessel. And if you would like to get his book, Mercury Rising, John Glenn, John Kennedy, and the New Battleground of the Cold War, simply click on the link in the description below. Of the book, Pulitzer Prize winner Professor David Kennedy says, if there's such a thing as a white-knuckled read, this is it. John Glenn emerges as both homespun hero and Cold War cat's ball, as well as a flesh-and-blood human being and one hell of a pilot. The featured brew was Houston Hayes IPA from the Spindle Top Brewery of Houston, Texas. If you want more information on the authors and the books, like the History of Go-Go Facebook page. And remember once again to subscribe to the podcast. The music was provided by the great North Carolina band Bones Fork. And if you want to know what they have going on, click on their link. It's in the description below as well. And finally, to the legion of listeners from 1,500 cities and over 70 countries, I have to say, once again, thank you. There are many more great episodes on the way. So join us again next time when we talk, think, and drink on History of Go-Go. We did research. We learned the new things first. And those were, and with a little investment and educated citizenry, away we went. We they, they, uh, became a leader in the world in just about a century and a quarter. It was a total resounding success, and uh, it was a great, great honor and pleasure to be a part of such a marvelous and successful program. Mm -hmm.